Okay, you may or may not know this, but um, I used to work at the Institute of Sport in Canberra. So between uh, finishing up in, um, at uh, Boeing Australia and starting my own company, um, I worked for the Institute of Sport in Canberra. So that was in the early 2000s. So I, I was involved with the Olympics in Athens in 2004 and uh, Beijing in 2008. So the um, uh, my, my role there was a technical uh, technical role to sort of help sports with their uh, technology. Cycling was obviously a, a, a big component of that, um, but I also worked with other sports, um, uh, rowing, did some archery stuff. Um, yeah, women's skeleton. Um, we even had to go down the uh, down the bobsled run um, on that. Um, in Calgary and uh, had a bit of a disagreement with the wall, but that's another story. Um, yeah, so I was, I was there, so, so as I said, cycling was a big part of, um, a part of what we we're doing. And one of the um, things we did spend a lot of time on was cycling power. Um, so at the time, uh, SRM cranks were sort of really the only um, the only sort of power meter uh, available. Then, uh, then power tap came in, um, and a few others. So it would have been around 2006, something like that, 2007. Um, we decided to have a look at what what else was in the market in terms of power meters, and uh, there were a number of things by that stage. As I said, there was. A, there was the power tap, which was a hub-based system, and um, I've already done a cut-up of one of those actually on on, on the channel. So uh, Shane Miller brought an old one in, and and um, and I cut it open to show how it's all um, how it all works. And um, yeah, I mean I can put a picture up here. So have a look at uh, at the picture. Um, the other one that, or the others that we looked at was, um, or were the, uh, the Ergomo. So Ergomo was, was quite a, a um, it was a different way of doing it. And it, it was basically a, a crank uh, or bottom bracket axle, which had two um, optical sensors in it, which would accurately measure the twist in the axle and therefore calculate what the torque was, etc. And it knew the um, the rotational velocity very accurately, also from the optical sensors, and and therefore um, could could measure power. So um, I'll put a, a little picture of that up um, up here, so you can have a look at the picture of that, and you can see that the uh, the optical sensor. Um, on each side, sort of, you know, sort of close to the bearing, um, there's a little optical, uh, optical sensor and um, and a segmented wheel, basically. So what gives it the sensitivity or the resolution is the number of slots in that wheel. So the more slots, the higher the resolution. Um, so that was quite an interesting system. Um, the downside to it, which was sort of revealed later, was um, that at the time they introduced that, everybody was really moving away from a separate bottom bracket axle and, and moving more towards the, um, the cranks like we have now where the axle is, um, is pressed in or it's part of the crank and you just have uh, bearings in the frame. So you don't have an axle in bearings in the frame, you just have the, the bearing. So like, so the system we've got now, so they were sort of really caught out by that, um, you know, basically. So when they launched that, then every, the Shimano and all the component manufacturers um, opted for uh, this other system. So it really took them out of the market. Another interesting one was the iBike. Now the iBike was um, instead of actually measuring um, force 
off the crank or the pedal or chain or hub or anything like that. What it what it did what it what it had was it had a um, a, a bunch of accelerometers in it um, and and a, an air pressure sensor and so it would mount to the front of the handlebar and it was it was meant to be set up in so it would have clean uh, clean air uh, into the air pressure sensor and and then so it would measure basically how fast you're going what the uh, the difference in 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 air pressure was on on the sensor so obviously if you're going into if you're going into a headwind there's um, higher aerodynamic uh, resistance uh, than if you've got a tailwind and so that that sensor was you know, was supposed to measure that um, and the accelerometers could measure the the inclination accurately and so obviously like when you're climbing you require higher power than when you're descending etc so um, so based on on those um, those sensors <clears throat> they had a number of little algorithms and you know you could then predict what the power would be um, instead of measuring it from a direct force power meter like the others were so it was quite a novel way of thinking um, the thing about it was it uh, it actually worked quite well um, if you got the calibration right now that was that was a tricky bit. It was very difficult um, to get a really good calibration on it. You needed, um, you really needed to, to, some really good set parameters there. So um, now the other final one that was available at the time um, was polar power. So polar were really popular and famous with their heart rate monitors. They basically started the whole heart rate monitor. Um, thing and at that time they introduced a um, a power a cycling power um, system now one thing to note is because the SRM patent was still current like so a patent typically lasts for 20 years and so um, all these other power meters, they had to come up with some other way of doing it. So you know, now you've got other, other power meters which are very similar um, to, to the SRM system, but at the time they, that, that would have infringed the patent and therefore they, you know, the, if you wanted power you had to do it a different way. So Polar came up with this sort of novel system of if we um, we measure the vibration of the chain and the vibration frequency of the chain is um, related to the tension of the chain and um, the tension of the chain is, is related to the force on the chain, um, et cetera, et cetera. So the, you know, the, basically you could measure torque, you could then measure the um, like the velocity, so they already had uh, had velocity. Um, yes, yeah, they had a, it had a little pickup on the jockey wheel, which would measure the velocity of the chain, and so they were trying to measure power like that. Now, there were a number of things about that, which um, some practicality. So, running in the lab was was okay, like it, like. If you run it on the treadmill, which which we did, I should talk about that in a minute. Um, but out in the field, there was definitely some problems with that because um, if you're riding on a bumpy road, the chain's bouncing around and all that sort of stuff. And then, um, depending on what uh, cog you're in, there was a different height off the chain stay. Um, yeah, so I mean, I'll show you. I'll show you a quick picture of. Um, uh, of the setup, um, so you can see that the the um, the sensors mounted on top of the chain stay, and then the the chain. Um, so basically, if you're in a different a different cog, the height off the the 
the uh, chain stay is going to be different. So like if you're in the 11 or the 12 or whatever you've got down the small end, um, it's going to be very close. If you're in the 21, 23 or whatever um, you're running at the back, it's going to be a lot further away. And same with the front, the front uh, crank if you're in the big ring or the small ring. So, so there were lots of variables and that sort of made it, made it unreliable. Um, so we had all these systems and we, we thought, well, we'll mount them all on the one bike and, um, and see what, uh, you know, which one is actually, uh, you know, how, how reliable and repeatable and all this sort of stuff are. Now, this was a bit of a project. Um, it actually got written up in, in Ride Cycling Review, um, an Australian mag, which I've got. So there was, here we go, we got um, that one there. That was part one, which sort of explained all the systems. Um, what issue was that? So that was summer 2007. Um, and then there was part two, which was that one. And that was the uh, autumn 2007. Um, so yeah, it was a two part, um, two part article where we went through um, you know, sort of explanations of the system. So one of the PhD students at the time Wrote, wrote the whole article up. So, um, so what we did, we got all these systems on the bike and um, so we had the Ergomo bottom bracket, um, we had SRM crank, um, we had the iBike on the handlebar, we had the power tap hub and we had the, um, the polar power system mounted on the, uh, on, on the chain stay. So, now the thing to mention about the, um, the SRM crank that we had, um, so at the time there were a number of different models of SRM crank. So there was the amateur version, which had two strain gauges in it. There was the professional version, which had four strain gauges in it. And then there was the science version, which had eight strain gauges in it. Um, now, we, we actually had, um, a couple of others there, some special ones, which had 20 strain gauges in, in it. So um, I'll show you a picture, I'll put a picture of what the inside of, um, of what the uh, professional SRM crank looks like and you can see the strain gauges in the circuit board, etc. Um, yeah, so I'll put that up now. So as you can see, there are um, yeah, you can, you can see the circuit boards. Strain gauges are mounted to those to those bars, and they flex uh, due to the torque between the crank arm and and the chain ring, effectively. So um, the the SRM cranks, as I said, that we had had um, twenty strain gauges, and so we tested these. Um, so these were specific, like for. Uh, for, for testing, we used them all the time in the lab, etc. And um, we had a good calibration history on them. So we also had our calibration rig, and I'll I'll show you a bit of a picture on that. Um, so the calibration rig, you'd mount the. It was really geared up for SRMs, uh, calibrating SRMs, because that's what we that's what we were using really at the time. So. You'd mount the the uh, SRM crank onto the bicycle, and and then you, you could on the non-drive side, you put a coupling on, and that was that coupling was driven by a motor at a known torque and a known speed, therefore known power. And we could calibrate that system all through first principles. It was a basically a torque reaction arm going onto a load cell. Um, and we could calibrate that with calibrated masses and make sure that that was all repeatable. So we had a lot of history with this SRM crank, uh, with, the, with SRM cranks. So that was one of my roles, um, sort of managing the calibrations of, of, of all that stuff as well. So, um, so we'd mount the, all these power meters onto the bike um, 
and we run a calibration check. Now the problem that we had with the iBike is because it wasn't actually measuring any, anything off, any force at the crank or um, anywhere else, it was like, how do we calibrate this thing? So, um, well, you, you, you can't. You, so you, you can't calibrate with traditional calibration sort of methods. So we all sort of stand around talking, how are we gonna do this? And then we came up with the whole, whole idea was, well, we know that we know the SRM cranks, um, these 20 strain gauge cranks are really good, um, really reliable. We know, we know their history, we know their repeatability. Why don't we just use that as, <coughs> pardon me, why don't we just use that as, as a reference um, and base everything around, around that? Um, and then sort of, um, I can't remember who it was, but one, one of us said, oh, we could use that like, like a gold standard. And, um, and then that sort of stuck. And then it, like, you know, that, that was then published in the article and you know, next minute, SRM is the gold standard. And um, you know, it was in their advertising and all that sort of stuff. And, uh, but yeah, you know, basically, you know, it was a reference from, you know, we just needed something, you know, a reference for the for for the eye bike. Um, anyway, um, that, that so that's there. That that's how the SRM gold standard sort of uh, came about. But so we did a whole bunch of testing, and we tested it on um, <clears throat> on the treadmill indoors, you know, in a lab environment, so we could adjust the speed and inclination, knowing the mass of the system, you know, bike and rider, you, you can calculate what the power is um, at that inclination. Um, and then a, um, a subject rider, you know, trained on it outdoors, rode crit races, did a whole bunch of things on it. Um, and then the data was all, was all analysed and compared. So um, yeah, it was sort of, you know, the an interesting foray into what was available and what worked and what didn't. And um, it was sort of, I mean, now you've got, you know, guys like DC Rainmaker and um, and Shane Miller, GP Lama, um, you know, being, Doing all that that sort of stuff on a uh, on a commercial level, almost like well, yeah, on their on their social media platforms, um, and and doing a great job of of analysing uh, what works and what doesn't, and and how it works and how it doesn't, and and th these comparisons. And uh, but uh, yeah, it was, it was sort of it was nice that um, to be part of that sort of initial initial sort of entry into the um, into the power market uh, game so going from basically SRM being the sole uh, the sole manufacturer and supplier to um, now there's uh, there's many many different options for power and, uh, and and the cost has come down significantly and you know all these other factors as well so yeah hope you learned something and uh, you know, a bit of history on power meters, and <clears throat> yeah, check out uh, check out Shane uh, Shane Miller, you know, GP Lama, his channel, and uh, and 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 DC Rainmaker for their sort of real in depth reviews, and you know, they've sort of taken this whole sort of thing to a whole nother level and and do a great job. So um, yeah, anyway, I'll leave it at that. Enjoy. Okay, bye.